Hi, um, I'm Roland Gilmet, uh, NR1G. I've been an amateur radio operator now for a couple of years, so I'm relatively new to this. Um, this is uh, this year's um, field day um, operation. Um, this is an annual event that's always the uh, fourth uh, full weekend in June, um, sponsored by the ARRRL. Which um, is? The Amateur Radio Relay League. Um, they are kind of the uh, spoke organization for um, amateur radio. Um, they're, um, they help organize the hams, they help us with uh, legislation, they help us with a, a number of uh, ham related issues. Um, Field Day is a, kind of a, this annual event that allows us to um, test our radio operating skills out in the middle of a field. Um, it gives us uh, the ability to, um, you know, test our radio equipment, test our communication and operating skills. What's field day? Um, so basically, um, as an operating event, what we do is um, we set up radio communication stations out in the middle of a field running off of emergency power, meaning generators or batteries. Um, sometimes alternative power like wind vanes. Um, in this case we have a solar panel um, at one of our sites um, that we're using to charge batteries that we're running off of so that counts as alternative power. Um, ham radio operators uh, come here when we start operating which will be at 2 p.m. today until um, 2 p.m. tomorrow. It's a 24-hour operating event. We'll operate around the clock. Um, we, the, the goal of the field day is to make as many contacts as we can. Um, we have a, um, an exchange which goes on between two operators which is we give information about our call sign which is N1NC, where we're located, um, which ARR se section that is, which so ours is um, Eastern Massachusetts, and we tell them how many transmitters we're operating. So today we're operating three alpha, which means we have three um, three transmitters. Um, one is going to be set up for single side band, which is basically what everybody knows to be uh, voice communication. We have one um, station set up to operate uh, CW, which is uh, what everybody knows as Morse code. And then we have another station set up for what's called the digital modes, which is um, basically uh, computer to computer communications, but we use the same kind of exchanges um, between operators um, that we would use um, like we were talking. Um, let's see. Um, some other information is we have another uh, site set up. It's a VHF, UHF radio station. And uh, why that's not included in the um, transmitter count is because it's um, considered a free station under the um, ARRL um, field day rules. So that station doesn't count against our transmitter count, but does count in allowing us to make contacts. Um, that station will be um, what you would think of as being um, FM communications. Um, it's uh, short di shorter distances than some of the other um, stations can achieve. Um, it's more specialized, um, so for example, one of the things that we will do is make contacts potentially with a satellite and, uh, um, uh, and that you need those higher frequencies for that particular um, mode of operation. So you're, uh, within the field day rules, um, you're allowed a certain amount of time to set up, um, get your site operational, and then um, once the official start begins, then the goal is to make as many contacts as you can. Um, I mentioned previously that we'd be operating around the clock. So uh, yes, there'll be people up um, in the middle of the night trying to make contacts with other um, amateur radio operators um, throughout the United States and Canada. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty extensive event. There's uh, uh, 65,000 plus hams that will participate um, in the event. Um, and uh, like I said, it does happen um, throughout the United States. So this is focused just on the United States, or yeah, United States and Canada. Okay. Although, um, if we make contacts with uh, uh, stations that are outside of our country, those get marked in a special way, 
and uh, but the primary goal is to make contacts um, uh, amateur station to amateur station in the United States and Canada. Could you go over the capabilities that you're actually training for, maybe like the ice storm a couple years ago? Yeah, um, actually, uh, this is what the, the primary purpose of the event is to um, practice um, setup of uh, radio communication equipment in the event of an emergency. So, um, for example, if we had an ice storm, um, how quickly could we get radio communications up and operational um, if um, uh, the infrastructure was impacted, like, like it was um, in one of the more recent ice, ice storms, uh, where we lost power and uh, communications in a lot of areas. Um, you know, we get so used to, you know, cell phone communication, uh, but if one of those towers were to be hit by an ice storm and knock it over, you would lose um, cell phone communications in that area. And uh, the other thing that um, is different about amateur radio is that um, we, we, have, we practice methods of communicating in the most extreme operating conditions. So um, uh, when I say extreme operating conditions, that, that, has a ten that means that um, it's difficult to establish communication between sites. Um, for example, if a cell phone tower were to go down, um, somebody could, we could set up a radio operating station relatively quickly and we follow these protocols that allow us to get messages back and forth um, very, very easily and very quickly um, and accurately. Um, uh, an example would be um, when you use your cell phone, you notice that how you always end up talking over each other. It's, it's hard to get the conversation coordinated sometimes. A person will start talking, you'll start talking, and then you'll have to shut up and then they shut up. And, you know, well, we have rules for how to handle that communication. Uh, so, so we practice this um, controlled handshake of communication. Um, we know when to be quiet. We have special codes that we use at the end of a conversation to let the other station know it's okay to proceed with their part of the conversation, and then they tell us when they're done. Part of the exchange that we use between stations is our call signs, which is unique to every amateur. Um, who is communicating. So we use that to establish who is quote-unquote on the line and providing um, the information. It identifies you uniquely to the other parties that may be listening. So it's a very important part. Thank you very much. Um, you're very welcome. Good. Well, I'm Stan Pazurski, president of the Neshoba Valley Amateur Radio Club. So the Neshoba Valley Amateur Radio Club is a club affiliated with the ARRL, uh, the national Association of Amateur Radio Operators in the U.S. And by being affiliated, it means that we do a certain number of things and, uh, for our members, be it training, uh, licensing. Um, a number of the club members work as VEs. Uh, amateur Radio Operators are licensed by the FCC, but they run the entire licensing process, the testing, and, and all of that. So there are a number of VEs, plus we do uh, various training classes. And as a club, uh, we, we are also a special service club. We do more, more for the community. So we, we support communications for various public, public events, public service events, like the Groton Road Race, <laughs> the Alzheimer's um, Memory Ride that runs out of Devons, uh, the Lonjo Road Bicycle Race, we support the uh, the uh, administration, the safety safety nets for ambulance calls for the officials for the Lonjo Road Lonjo Bicycle Race, which is over in Fitchburg, Sterling, <coughs> Princeton, uh, that runs Fourth uh, of July weekend. Uh, we do another a number of other events, uh, everything from providing public address systems for the Groton Memorial Day Parade. The pep we do. We help organize the Pepperell Fourth of July Parade by having some communications around uh, for the buses and for um, putting all the parade pieces in place in the right order. Um, and then, then in the broader area, a number, a lot of people go and actually help at uh, things like uh, the marathon, the Walk for Hunger. All of those use amateur radio operators to communicate whether it be for busing, uh, ambulance help, whatever. Um, so we, we, a lot of us do that. 
and then there are events like this that are just for fun. <laughs> so that's uh, some of the activities that the, the Shoba Valley Amateur Radio Club takes in. He's obviously got it right because he has to like to eat. He was always barking. He's on tranquilizer. Hey, just because I stole stands. Stole mine, so I'm going to have cookies instead. My name is Bob Reif, and my amateur radio call is W1XP, and I am a board member of the Neshoba Valley Amateur Radio Club, and have been a member for probably 15 or more years. I've been at HAM for 55 years. This, this is the CW station. CW station. And CW, to an amateur radio operator, means primarily Morse code, which is on and off key uh, of a signal that I was maybe trying to tune in an example here, but everybody's waiting for fielding to start in about an hour and a half. Right. There's a nice CW signal. The telegraph operator years ago, you know, went tackety tackety tackety, but with the radio it goes yeah. a tone on and off. Um, so with a with tone, with uh, decoding those tones all in our head, um, we're able to uh, talk to people all over the world. And it's kind of a universal language because we all speak Morse code. And that's convenient with letters if you speak English or if you know the other person's language you can translate to something but, that makes sense to them. But, but we yeah. use special codes the, so so we right. can talk to a fellow in Russian and yeah. I say to the Russian my QTH and yeah. he says uh, he's going to tell me where he lives. Right. So yeah. the next thing I hear, the next thing I copy in the code will be where he's located. Yeah, sure. Uh, so that's a nice signal. Uh, yeah. There's the other station he's talking to. Uh, but, but with the, uh, the, the keys here, or we use a, a computer to, uh, to keep track of our contacts. When, when I hear somebody, I call them with the key and then uh, they come back and we exchange information, which is usually uh, what kind of uh, mode we're operating in our contest, which is primarily how many uh, transmitters we have on our emergency setup site. And uh, in our location, uh, which is kind of like the state you're in, uh, although the, some of the states are divided up into multiple sections. Um, we record that information along with a report as to how well we are hearing each other. And that all gets load, loaded into the computer and kept track of, and at the end of the contest we can look at the computer file and it tells us who all we talked to and how many we talked to and where all they were we talked to. 
which is all very important and makes us feel proud because we have a nice big number. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It's 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 all the the competition is of course to see how many different people we can talk to in how many different places all over the country and for that matter all over the world. But uh, but this operation uh, field day is primarily a, a U.S. and Canadian only event. Uh, although there are events that uh, are more global in nature, uh, we can talk to people in other countries and they count as valid contacts. The, uh, the setup is uh, typical of, uh, of many amateur stations uh, all over the country. We go out in the, the field someplace, we uh, put an antenna in the tree, or in our case we happen to have a, a nice uh, mobile uh, tower we can use, which I suspect you've seen. Uh, have generators to provide the power. We have uh, to take care of uh, the usual day-to-day -day things like food and, and sleeping for that matter. <laughs> you come back at 2 o'clock in the morning, you might find me <laughs> curled up on a cot in the corner of the tent here. What does amateur mean? Amateur? What does amateur mean? Good question, Ralph. Off camera. Amateur, of course, uh, you can be an amateur and you can do something very, very well. It just means you don't do it for money, is I think a very simple uh, explanation. A professional would do it and expect a monetary return. An amateur does it and he, uh, he doesn't expect anything but the enjoyment of doing it, usually. And that's what we've done, uh, <laughs> I was telling uh, the man behind the camera, I've been doing this for 55 years, and uh, it's led to a very uh, long and interesting career in electronics and uh, communications, and has taken me around the world and to the bottom of the ocean and to, uh, uh, I didn't get to fly on the space shuttle, but my radio flew on the space shuttle, so I uh, wow. felt uh, great uh, attachment to our shuttle program. Have you ever communicated with the shuttle in yes. amateur radio? Um, and, and the space station. The, uh, the amateur radio club in the Shoba Valley Amateur Radio Club, which is what's sponsoring this event here, about five years ago, uh, provided the, uh, the equipment and the antennas and everything to allow a uh, secondary school class in uh, Townsend to actually have about a 20 minute uh, communication with the space station where they got the, uh, the classroom children uh, ask questions of the astronauts and then the astronaut would, would answer the question. And there were about, uh, I believe about 20 students that were able to, uh, to ask the question and receive the answer. By, uh, by amateur radio. This is uh, through FM? It was an FM. Uh, yeah. Uh, no video, just... No, no, not yeah. video, just, yeah. just audio. Yeah. But uh, the, most of the astronaut corps are amateur radio operators. Part of it is the use of amateur radio to keep in contact with, with family and friends. And uh, I think... Uh, I think there's a kind of a polarization between uh, people who are into things like space and, and science and technology are also kind of interested in amateur radio. Now, now not every amateur is by a, any means a, a technician or a scientist. We have plenty of, uh, of, of people in other non-technical walks of life that are active, uh, very active amateur radio operators. And some of them are very technical radio amateurs uh, and yet have no technical training at all uh, in their background. They just read the books and pick it up as they go. Um, mm -hmm. Amateur radio has, uh, has been good to me. Does everybody have a big uh, tower in their yard? No. 
a, I'm probably the, I've always felt the poorest example because I've, I, I, I tend to collect radios. I like to collect old radios and I like to collect new radios. <laughs> but uh, most, uh, most radio amateurs have a, a small antenna and a, a single radio setting on a corner of a table and uh, some kind of unused room and uh, some some people will actually have it in the family room. Uh, some uh, some spouses even uh, even find amateur radio interesting. <laughs> and in fact, uh, there are many families where uh, most of uh, the members of the family have, uh, are interested in amateur radio. It tends to get passed along. Uh, my uh, my wife is an amateur radio operator. Hmm. And uh, she's fourth generation in her family. It's on her side. And our son is a fifth generation. Excellent. It does get passed along. Mm -hmm. Any uh, any other questions? No, that's... Where does Cam come from? That's a good question, and there's no simple answer. But um, where does what come from? Ham. Oh, ham. Yeah. Oh, it, yes. It, it originally appears to have been a very derogatory word used by some amateurs towards others <laughs> and um, uh, so it was the ham was kind of like the ham operator you know not not to, uh, the ham actor not totally uh, professional which uh, not good standard not good quality not not a and, and, but it, it certainly isn't that way now. Um, everybody's a ham, and, and it has no no derogatory. But but there's lots of discussion about that through the literature. I uh, I think ham radio is is a, an excellent hobby, and unfortunately. Uh, We need lots of new and young people to join the hobby. I don't know how we do that, how we compete with uh, all the scientific and, and the fascinating uh, games we have on computers and, and things today. Uh, as, a, as a kid, I, I was absolutely fascinated with the idea that I could build something talk to somebody even in the next state, let alone on the other side of the world. But, uh, I think uh, that, uh, that aspect with our cell phones and our internet and everything is, uh, is not as uh, big an issue with the young kids anymore. Speaking of computers, I see you have a computer here on the table. Uh, are computers connected to radios? More and more. Um, <laughs> the, the ham radio goes back a lot farther than computers. Ham radio is almost a hundred years old. Yeah. And um, of course, computers are lucky to, to be around. Uh, I guess we go back to World War II and we really dig through the the history of the computer. The first one was was made by the Brits in, uh, in uh, Benchley Park. The, the Let's Break the, the Enigma Code yeah. effort, which uh, they tore the computer apart and hit it because they, the pieces because they didn't want anybody to know they had done it. Uh, really, today, yeah. today, an amateur radio station without a computer is a very rare thing. It's used for logging, and it's used to process a lot of the new digital modes, mm -hmm. keyboard to keyboard modes, which are very similar to the internet, where you, uh, you, you type a message into a computer, and it goes through your radio, it comes out of another radio and goes into a computer, and all kinds of magic, scientific, number crunching 
things happen in the computer which allow you to communicate with minimal power, very poor signals, under very extreme conditions. And of course this is all very important because you need communications most when communications are hardest to do. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of people devoting their own private time developing the software. The software and computers aren't my strong suit at all. I build the radio part of the radio piece. <laughs> But, uh, when you get to poor communications, the, do they uh, go to actual Morse code type slow bandwidth signals to computer to computer to communicate, or are you sticking with higher ASCII type codes over the air? Actually both. There's, there's, there's the two schools. Some are just very, very slow Morse. Yeah. Um, that's not slow at all. <laughs> Much slower. And the other approach is is to take and, and and use complex coding. I'll call it complex coding. You use the word ASCII. Essentially, it starts at ASCII and then it gets encoded into more more powerful okay. codes. Uh, the, the 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 trick word or whatever is forward error correction. Ah. Which, which means you send a lot more information and you send it many times and, and, and you're then able to pull out the message by, by reconstructing this, uh, this, big, this long message which has been decoded into a much longer, or been encoded into a much longer message. And of course the amateurs were doing this many, many years ago by just sending things over and over and over. You send your name three times and the guy would, would eventually be able to, to copy and say, oh, that's Bob. <laughs> and and it's, it's basically the same thing except, except when you do it with computers, you can, you can take advantage of much more powerful things than just sure. blunt repeating and repeating and repeating. It's, it's just like, what did you say? I'm going to say it again. Yeah. But um, amateur radio has, has provided emergency communications in many, many disasters for many, many years. And I remember very well, I worked with a, a fellow many years ago who told about how in the hurricane, after the hurricane of 1938, he drug his amateur radio station, which was much more complicated in those days, and this was big, big, heavy pieces of, of metal. <laughs> and he drug it up to the top floor of the city hall in Providence, Rhode Island, and put Providence on the air and in communications with the rest of the world. Because and he was the only inlet or outlet for for the town for several days after the, the big hurricane mm. that, uh, that was so devastating in 1938. And uh, he just did it. I mean, he was uh, as, as as we all are. You know, we don't know we're a hero until we do it after we've done it. So uh, that's what this is all about. He had been through several field areas. He knew what to do and how to see it. And when the time came, he did. And that's just the way he felt. Yeah. He loved to tell the story, but he wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, a special person. He was just a good hand. Excellent. Hi, my name is Bruce Blaine and I'm Vice President of the Neshoba Valley Amateur Radio Club. Um, I'm station captain for the uh, phone station this weekend. Uh, we're going to be operating on all of the shortwave uh, frequency bands, talking to people all around the country, and we're going to be doing this using uh, voice. Uh, the station is set up. If you want to run Morse code, uh, operators who are interested in Morse code can do that as well. 
um, but this is primarily uh, dedicated for people who want to operate uh, using voice modes. You said it was a phone station. What does that mean? Well, it's phone uh, literally means you use a microphone and you use voice uh, in order to make the, uh, the contacts. So, for instance, I'm listening to a frequency here now. It's before the contest, but you can hear people getting ready for the contest. Side of the yeah. conversation. It's because uh, we're using the ionosphere to bounce off, and he may be in our skip zone, and his signal is just bouncing over us. Could you describe some of what he's saying and some of the shortcuts he's using sure. in the dialogue? Norway 1, Norway Charlie. So, First, you get a call sign. Each station has an individual call sign that's assigned by the Federal Communications Commission. So we're N1NC. Okay, QSL means you acknowledge my report. Uh, he said five by three, that's a signal report. So five meaning he's perfectly uh, copyable. And uh, the second number is uh, three out of nine, which means that he's fairly weak. So even though the receiving station can hear him, he's not that loud. Okay, very good. So, uh, 73 from Calgary, thanks for contact um, into Texas. Norway 1, Norway Charlie. He has a lot of stations calling him. Is, is he a prime um, a contact because of where he is? Not necessarily. I think for the contest, everybody gets an equal number of points. Uh, he's just okay, getting prepared for the contest, and so he's spending a lot of time talking with people. Warming up. So, WA. November 1, November Charlie, N1, NC. You know, one of the things is the, the antenna's pointed kind of southwest, and he's kind of northwest, so um, we can change, stay here, tune around a little bit. I assume you're going to be editing some of this anyway, right? Maybe. <laughs> now you, you hear got that? Four hours to fill, right? <laughs> that's that's what's called slow scan television. W9BR, November 1, November Charlie. November Charlie, 5-9, uh, uh, W9BR. Yeah, W9BR, November 1, November Charlie. You're also 59 in Massachusetts. Name here is Bruce. Go ahead. Yeah, Bruce, uh, good signal. Uh, just north of Chicago here, Illinois. And uh, for the log, what's your name? Go ahead. Yeah, it's Harry, Hotel Alpha, Romeo, Romeo Yankee. 
Okay, Harry, very good. You've got a nice signal here. We'll see you in field day. 7-3. 7-3, good luck. 79-BR. 73 is an old uh, telegra telegrapher's term, uh, meaning best regards. Um, it's kind of it kind of started using Morse code, and it's one of those things that have carried over into into voice and into everything else. So, Albuquerque, not real strong, but I've got a crawl here, a three man dipole that you had over the salt marshes. Very working well. Very very good indeed. And again. Uh, delighted that uh, we can have this uh, QSO with you. And appreciate... Uh, you hear a lot of uh, abbreviations uh, beginning with Q. Uh, QSO, QSL, those are also old um, international um, uh, abbreviations that started with the military so that Morse code operators who did not necessarily speak the same language could transfer information to each other. WHBRN, November 1, November Charlie. Now again, November 1, November Charlie, I believe the call is Washington number 8. Echo Radio November, over. Very good. Uh, Whiskey 8, Echo Radio November. From the November 1, November Charlie, uh, you're 59 into Massachusetts. The name is Bruce. And uh, like you, we're getting ready for field day. Go ahead. Okay, Bruce. Well, I, I, I don't know. I'll probably not be a real big participant this year, but uh, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll uh, give out a few reports probably. I may uh, jump down to 40 uh, down there for a little while. But anyway, uh, uh, this is, by the way, our second QSO, Bruce. I worked you last year, 27th of June, uh, and it was on six meters. Go ahead. Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, we uh, operated field day last year on six meters as well, and so uh, that's uh, quite a coincidence. By the way, uh, my home call is Kilo One Bravo Golf, and we're operating here with the Neshoba Valley Amateur Radio Club in Pepperell, Massachusetts, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again next year. What's what's your name for the log, please? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't give it to you. The name is Angela, A-N-G-E-L-O, and the QTH, Brighton, Brighton, Michigan, 40 miles northwest of Detroit, running a Pro 3 and a three-element stepper beam. And what, uh, uh, what is the rig and antenna you're using there, uh, Bruce, uh, from Pepperell? Yeah, the uh, rig here is a FT-1000 MP. Uh, we've got a four-element Yagi. That's at about 70 feet on top of a little hill. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, it sounds pretty good. It sounds like you're getting ready to do some serious 20-meter uh, 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 contesting there today. Well, that sounds great, and I'm sure you're going to do uh, very, very well. And I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, say hello uh, to us there. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, it's uh, always uh, nice to uh, uh, have repeat you shows whenever possible. Anyway, Pete, and, and by the way, I have your uh, home call there as, uh, what was it, K yeah, K1BG, K1BG, sounds good. And maybe we'll uh, get a chance to work you from your home base sometime uh, in the near future. If you get a chance sometime, keep it in mind, W8, everything running normally. WADRN.com. There we have uh, some interesting features, and you can pick up a free uh, ham web page uh, for yourself as well. Take care, keep in touch, more importantly, keep smiling, and have a, have a good time out there on field day. And 1MC uh, in Pepperell, Massachusetts. I believe it's in the Middlesex County from WADRN, right in Michigan. Okay, Angelo, thank you very much, 73, and uh, we'll look for you, uh, look for you at home as well, and uh, maybe we'll look for you on the Saturday of the fourth f uh, full weekend in June next year. Uh, 73, and thank you for the report. W8ERN from K, uh, sorry, from November 1, November Charlie, 73. Okay, sounds great. By the way, what kind of mic do you have in there? It's got a, some a very sharp, uh, what shall I say, um, uh, the high end is uh, very brilliant there, go ahead. Yeah, it's just a standard D-104. Go ahead. Ah, okay. Very, very good. 
Very good. Uh, sounds excellent. Uh, excellent uh, sound for um, punching through. Uh, N1NC, Pepper L, WADRN, now clear, WADRN listening. 7-3. 198, please. 198, NC. Yeah, who's calling me, please? November 1, November Charlie? Okay. N1, NC. I didn't know if I'd snag you there in between all of the uh, pile of W6 SFG. Good afternoon. Uh, name here is the same as yours. I'm located in Lynchburg, Virginia. And, um, and, uh, <laughs> Like Angelo said, uh, you're about to rip my ear off. Uh, uh, I ran a Z104 on this uh, radio for a while, too. I'm, I'm now uh, running the uh, MD100, but this is also an FT1000 MP0 number two. Over. Okay, Bruce, very good. Yeah, uh, I guess you caught uh, the end of the last conversation. And uh, also, uh, are you uh, getting ready for field day as well? Go ahead. Well, I'll need to run up and see what our guys are doing um, at field day in the club. And uh, by the way, let me do this. I'll play you a little, um, uh, the tail end of Angelo and the front end of yours, and uh, let you hear a little bit of yourself. Uh, here it comes. Pepperell, Massachusetts. I believe it's in the Middlesex County from WADRN, right in Michigan. Okay, Angelo, thank you very much. 73, and uh, we won't see you. I uh, wish you at home as well. And uh, maybe we won't see you on the Saturday of the 4th. Okay. Uh, so, uh, there, there's a little bit of a, a blast back. Anyway, I'm running the uh, 1000 MP, Alpha 374 amplifier, uh, KT34. Um, not even on you right now. And I'm, so, uh, this is transceiver, right he's got an amplifier, uh, his antenna. And, um, we're down here in Lynchburg, Virginia, where it's about 90 some odd degrees today. W6SFG. Yeah, is that Sierra Fox Golf W6SFG? San Francisco Giants, Southern Fry Grit, or Schwarzenegger for Governor. You got it. Okay, very good there, Bruce. W6SFG from K1BG. Yeah, very good. Well, I don't know how much you caught of the uh, last uh, conversation. We've got a, a four-element Yagi at about 70 feet that's uh, turned with a, a tether rope, uh, and uh, it's on top of a nice crank-up uh, tilt-over tower on a trailer. And uh, for the first year, I think, uh, in a long time, we've got several minutes to spare before field day, and uh, everything is up and running, and uh, we're going to have a pretty good time this weekend. I'm going to say 73. There's a couple of uh, little tasks I've got to get done, and uh, we'll be back on the air in about a half an hour. Uh, so 73, Bruce, and thank you uh, very much for the signal report, and we'll catch you again. W6SFG from November 1, November Charlie. Okay, good luck. Have a great day. God bless. W6SFG. Okay, thanks again. Now, is the November, November 1, November Charlie call sign, is that for this site or in it, general for this one occasion? Well, it's actually the radio club applied for and received a call from the FCC. So this is actually... Um, this is actually the club's call sign. And each operator who will be operating here have their own call sign, but for the field day and for some other public service activities we perform, we use the club call sign. I see. And your, yours has a, the second letter is a one, and the division start in the east and work to the west coast to nine, uh, I think? Through zero, actually. Zero. Okay. Yep. Um, but, um, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, the FCC now allows when hams move around the country to keep their old call sign. So, for instance, 6 is usually California. The last station we worked was W6SFG. He's in Lynchburg, Virginia. He probably originally got his call sign in California, but he's moved and kept his call sign. And then the uh, first letter sort of d denotes the country? Not necessarily. Not well, first the, prefix. the very first letter. Okay, generally is the country. So yeah. the United States has W, K, and N. Okay, mm -hmm. and for instance, if you ever go to Logan Airport and you look at the airplanes, there's a number on the tail or on the fuselage. That number for a U.S. carrier always begins with N. Right. Now I can go into an airport and look at the airplane and by looking the, at the number on the tail, know what country it's from just the same way I can sure. tell from an amateur license.
1728, is that right? Hmm? The time. It's uh, 13 to 30. Oh, uh, that's an UTC. Oh. Hi, I'm Ralph Swick. I'm the treasurer of the Missouri Valley Amateur Radio Club. Excellent. I'm here on a fine Saturday with uh, Field Day 2010. Excellent. And I see you have a trailer here. Is it is it custom or commercial or? Well, the, ba the basic frame is a, is a commercial unit with the, uh, with the tilt up tower and it rests on here and the, and the toolbox up front. That's all part of what the commercial uh, uh, unit comes in. I think they were built for mobile cell towers and things like that. And we we uh, were very fortunate to uh, get it uh, used to surplus and we added cabinetry to it and this uh, tube for storing antennas and things. So we've customized it for our use. And it's, uh, it's a good thing to have for emergency communications. Sure. What, what's in the larger box here? More communications gear? It's, it's this storage, um, the, uh, the, the die wires that secure the tower when we put it up, and, and uh, cables to connect the antennas to the radio, and tools and, and things. We, in, in principle, we've, we've thought that we could set this up and if there was a long-term power outage. Uh, we might set this up somewhere with a repeater radio inside, a repeater set it up as a repeater station with, with batteries to, to uh, batteries to run the radios and it would just sit out here on a hill and, and act as a, as a repeater to allow our handheld radios to, to, to cover a wider area. We've never actually had to do that. But, uh, but the cabinets would allow us to, to secure uh, a receiver and transmitter inside if we need to. It seems that that might be a worthwhile exercise to Someday. set it up and... Sure, sure. Well, we've, we've done all the pieces to do that we have used in other, in other configurations. So we use this at the Groton Road Race every year. Yeah. And we set it up uh, near, the, uh, um, near the Florence Roach School. Uh, to, to run our, our uh, operation, like a dispatch operation for the Rotten Roadways from there. And, uh, and some years for that we have created a mobile repeater site that we've used with it. So we have all the components, we just haven't ever, yeah. fortunately, yeah. needed to assemble them together to put up here on a hill and let it run for a week. So, so if you had to, you could get it together in a hurry. If we had yeah. to, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's Excellent. that's part of what this weekend 24-hour uh, exercise is about, to test out all the equipment and, uh, and assure ourselves that we could do that if we needed to. Excellent. Very good. Thank you, sir. It might be a little hard to take uh, to, to photograph, but this, but the radio they were working on was a um, a weather station that transmits the weather data over over amateur radio. Yeah, I was wondering what you were doing with the wind vane and the yeah. The, uh, so does that transmit automatically, or is it something you can key in yourself? It transmits automatically. I don't know if it's hard to get a good shot of, but yeah. So this is uh, this is an automated weather uh, transmitting station, weather reporting station. You saw the wind vane up there on the on the short piece of pipe. Uh, so there's a, a weather station here, which receives the uh, weather, the wind speed and the wind direction, and then uh, converts it to a signal which can be transmitted over the amateur radio. So, so the radio, the silver box up on top is the weather station, and the uh, and the black box underneath with all the knobs on it is the uh, is the radio transmitter. So it periodically, every uh, every uh, couple minutes, it transmits the weather information that uh, along with the seen. call sign for the signal. Along, along with the yeah. call sign, which exactly. is required. We're always we're required to include the uh, the FCC uh, call sign in every transmission. So, and then the, so that's done yeah. some, over something that's called digital packet. So ah. um, so that it. it uh, uh, it's it, it's a little. It kind of sounds like a like a noise burst, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's digital packet, and uh, and and anybody can receive this. You don't actually need an amateur radio license to receive to listen. Anybody can receive this, and there's different kinds of programs you can run on a computer, which will plot both the location of this weather station and the weather data on a map. So and does it send out lat long, latitude, longitude along with the exactly, in the burst? Exactly. So each yeah. each data packet, each each 
each burst of information includes the weather data and the position where we are on the on the globe and uh, and of course the uh, the radio call sign the radio identification it include temp temperature as well uh, temperature yeah. and uh, and uh, I believe time and time of day is in oh, there as okay. well and then the antenna is so this little antenna on on top of the white toolbox is the is the transmitting antenna for the weather station for the weather station right and what band do you transmit on is it this is this is typically what we call two meters or okay. 140 megahertz is, and is up the, on the hill here in the pepper orchard what kind of range would you expect to get out of it we're, we have a pretty high pretty good location here uh, I don't know what power level this this transmitter is set to but uh, but this can probably be heard for 30 or 40 miles we're, okay. we're, in a, we're in a good high location here and then and then of course there there are repeater stations specifically for digital as well so there's there's other receiver transmitter combinations that will hear that digital packet burst and retransmit it and in fact some of those put it on the internet so without a radio you can log into the internet and there's a website you can go to and see all the weather data on a website it's called APRS uh, amateur uh, position reporting system and uh, uh, so you can you can look on the on a web page and, and see our weather data for now people. is that your web page or is there a web page that collects a, a whole bunch of these it, around it's the a country web page that collects a lot of these around the country so ah, so everybody whoever well, they can report into that one page. Right. Well, it's it's listening to uh, it's listening to the reports over the internet that it receives. Ah, um, then yeah. some of those are coming just uh, they're heard off the air and then and then uh, resent on the internet to the central uh, server that's running that particular web. Page. Now, would you register your site on that you're transmitting on the internet to that website so they know to pick you up into their database? It's it's uh, it's just open. We connect yeah. well. There's a, another relay station somewhere here in Massachusetts that's hearing what we're transmitting on the air and inserting it on the internet, and it's just connected to that yeah. to that website and just periodically sends all our, our data into there. It's all automatic, right? We don't have to do anything. We're just transmitting our data on the air, and and other stations are hearing it and and retransmitting it for us. Now you're doing this on the field day up here in the, the orchard in Pepperell, but do you keep uh, this station running all the time anyway, or is it just uh, on special occasions? This is uh, Jim, N8VIM, brought this equipment here, and I imagine he keeps it running all the time at, at his home normally. I see. Jim? <laughs> Hello. What's your name and your James relationship? Hine. James Hine. Uh, call is November 8th, Victor, India Mike. And I've had my PRS with their station at the house as a NAVM-2 for about uh, eight years now, which I know the data is picked up by NOAA. It's occasionally used in local weather reports. Interesting. On the television. Do you keep it up 24-7? 24-7. It's uh, battery-backed. It can run uh, probably about two weeks on battery. Very good. Hopefully we don't have uh, a situation like that. Yeah. I think I'd be valuable when they do have natural like the ice storm issues that they could see what the situation is around. Are there uh, weather stations like this scattered around uh, Massachusetts and Northeast? Oh yeah, um, there, there's a whole bunch. Um, some, some uh, even if you're not involved in amateur radio, there's a citizen's weather observation program where instead of transmitting it on the uh, radio network, you transmit through the internet. So even anyone without a license could have set up a weather station, have their computer set up to transmit on the internet. So that, that has nothing to do with the radio; it's just internet feed. So it started out up. with the uh, sure. the radio feed, um, but you know some people take it to the internet, and hmm. uh, mine actually is acts as a uh, repeater for other APRS mobile stations, and. It, uh, there's, I'm close enough to a gateway, I don't have to go directly to the internet. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome.
And here is the Shuba Rio Club's generator that they're using to power their field day here in Pepperell on the 26th of June 2010 in the uh, infamous apple orchard. Larry Sweezy from yeah. Groton. Okay. I'm part of the uh, Groton Communications uh, Emergency Management Group. And our director is uh, Chief Donald Palmer. And Don Palmer has uh, made this the use of this vehicle available for us as a uh, community service wagon and uh, a communication center. The, the rationale for all of this is to have some mobile communication packaged and ready to go in the event of uh, some form of disaster or distress and the, uh, if you remember back a couple of winters ago when we had the ice storm, uh, this communications group was very active during the storm. Uh, a lot of us did shelter duty, and, uh, but we didn't have our own uh, emergency vehicle. All the other emergency vehicles, of course, were tied up. And so our response to that is uh, to take a surplus vehicle from the United States Air Force and have that uh, converted, painted, and now converted uh, for uh, civilian use in the local area. So you'll probably see this wagon at uh, parades, uh, road races, uh, and hopefully not too many emergencies. And we model our, uh, our, our, some of our modeling is done after what the, uh, what the Red Cross does, as well, Ralph is uh, well aware of. Uh, and so we will uh, learn from their experience and bring our own expertise uh, to uh, completing this device. So what does this station do? What are you going to be running on field day out of here? For field day, uh, this is the digital mode station. Uh, George Cavanaugh, who's sitting up here, is uh, ready to go. And it's getting close to start time. Uh, we will operate in, in strictly a digital mode, which involves a lot of typing and no talking. Uh, you talk with your fingers, uh, since that seems to be everybody's favorite mode in email and texting these days, it, it fits right in with uh, what's available in, uh, in equipment. So you're typing on a computer keyboard? We type on a computer keyboard and that's uh, in, encoded out, transmitted out, and others who have uh, similar equipment receive it. Uh, they acknowledge our transmission and they respond. When they respond, we acknowledge theirs. We uh, exchange uh, uh, we exchange calls and uh, we log that in a computer. So this is uh, this is, can be done without uh, benefit of pen or pencil. Uh, it. It is part and parcel of uh, uh, the technology that allows us to uh, send emails, and uh, and the, the but the real caveat is that we can do it without wires, and we can go set up anywhere uh, with just the vehicle power and handle uh, uh, text messages and 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 voice messages as well. Our cell phone works without wires and handles text messages and voice messages. But your cell towers don't stay up all the time. You know, when you lose your infrastructure, when you lose the fiber optic uh, coax cable infrastructure, when you lose the cell towers, uh, in, a, in an emergency, in a power outage, the cell towers are only up for a specified amount of time beyond the power outage. 
and then eventually they run out of battery or gasoline or whatever it is that powers their local area. If it's an extended emergency, which in some areas, in this, as you're well aware, in this area, that was uh, a prolonged emergency. And we have the capacity to outlast that emergency. And that's where our support comes from. What kind of range does this digital equipment that you're running today have? Uh, I talked to Australia last week. Yes. Yeah, so really? We, we can talk, yeah. Uh, great distances under favorable conditions, under almost any conditions, we have a range, easily a radius of 30 to 50 miles. And hopefully that would get us communication outside of our particular disaster area. You, you want to be able to hop over the disaster with your communication. And the advantages that ham radio has is we have the frequencies available to us across the entire spectrum that let us pick and choose the optimum frequencies for the given conditions. So we can, we can go over the, out of the disaster area and that way maintain the communication and get the necessary help. In, in a disaster where we're isolated, would you have uh, pre-established uh, protocol or uh, logistics to communicate with the state bunker or the state facilities? Yes, instead? absolutely. Yeah. We have a monthly uh, uh, net that we get together the first Monday of the month and we uh, do exactly that. We communicate uh, through the area, network to the bunker in Framingham, and and that is a uh, and then uh, maybe once or twice a year you'll have a uh, a disaster drill. And we also participate in local drills. I mean things with Neshoba Hospital and uh, and surrounding towns, Air, Shirley, Pepperell, Townsend. So and. By nature, you know the hams that are associated with it, with Aries and Races, which are the organ communication organizations that that uh, organize the, the the communication. So you 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 need that. Uh, everyone is spread around, so you end up with uh, folks knowing each other from afar, which is also uh, gives you the you know the opportunity to pull from from a large area. You're running off the batteries now? Uh, no, we've got shore power. Oh, okay. We have. Uh, oh, there's the cable. There. Yeah, yeah. But there's, uh, there's a dual pack of uh, deep discharge. Yeah. Now, is that something that was part of the ambulance package that came? Or did you add you your can, own inverters and stuff? It's. it's it's hard to believe how incredibly lucky we are to get this vehicle because it is just it, it is just so uh, ready to be made into a communications van. When you have it, uh, when you have all the the power and lighting that is needed to run an ambulance, and now it's available to uh, run equipment, we will never tap all of the power that's available in this in this vehicle. I mean, the, the size of the transmitters that we typically run are no challenge for the battery generator combination of this, uh, uh, what it takes to run an ambulance. And everything is redundant because it has to be in an ambulance and that's, uh, that's also very favorable. So you could run any gear or any band by running whatever gear you need into this and set it up so it isn't pre-installed. All of the, well, we've got to differentiate between field day, yeah. which is the practice of bringing your stuff from home and running it in the field. And that's, that's quite a bit different from what we're eventually going to do with this uh, 
with the installation in this vehicle, we have equipment that would be permanently installed. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't be cricket to uh, come to field day and just turn your installed equipment on because you don't learn anything from that. I mean, you, you know, you're just running a contest. So the way that you, the field day's exercise has to be a challenge. It has to be a little bit of pain associated with it. There has to be something that's broken or doesn't work quite right. Then you've done a field day. When you, when you break a sweat, then you know you've done a field day. And that's what, that's what you see here. Next year, uh, when you come back, uh, you will see a battery of equipment installed in there, nice and shiny, and panels and that. Now that will be the equipment that we would use in an emergency. Because in an emergency, of course, you've got to be ready to go. You can't be installing equipment when it starts raining or the wind starts blowing. It's a little bit late for that. So. We need, uh, we'll have everything installed here, antennas ready to go, uh, we'll be able to drive to any place that we can drive, it's a four-wheel drive vehicle, and set up and operate. That is an emergency EOC operation uh, configuration, and, and this, is, uh, this is more challenging in some ways, but is it's a different exercise. That young man in the back there belongs to me too. It's my grandson. His second Three Alpha, Ontario. So we'll try to get him. Now it says stop here at the end. And it means just we stop transmitting when it gets there. And now we're receiving it again. And it's going back. And see it. He's in Ontario. We will send his report. DE3A, DE from N1NC. We're 3A, Eastern Massachusetts. He's a 599, means you get a strong signal. Please acknowledge. So let's see if he comes back. There he is. W2C. He's a 3 Alpha Ontario. So, I'm going to go put him in the logbook. I'm going to call him a. Uh, Three Alpha, East Ontario, Canada. It's on this side. Ontario. Ontario. Ontario, right there. And then I said add to log. Right here, add to log. And then if I look at the log book, there he is, V3AA. He's from Ontario. Tell, tell me your name and your association okay. with the club. My name is Gary Bussler. I'm really from the Townsend Purple Garden area. Yep. I'm currently living in Townsend like I have for about 30 years. And I'm a member of, of the, uh, the uh, Neshoba Valley Club. I'm also a member and past president of the uh, Montachusetts Amateur Radio Association, which is doing the same thing in Westminster today. And I kind of alternate between this. Is this is my uh, tower trailer. It's got uh, antennas for VHF, for 50 megahertz, for 150 megahertz, for 440 megahertz, and also a satellite link. 
Additionally, we have a satellite link here. You'll be seeing the station that's actually operating it. But it's electrically operated. You assemble it, push a button, and up the tower goes. And it's it's great for an outing like this. Excellent. So, uh, and it's, uh, it's fully equipped. Everything's battery operated. We do have generators and power supplies and repair equipment, including welding equipment, everything else on board. So it's a great it's a great hobby. It's a lot of fun. Now, is this equipped to mainly support your amateur radio activity? I actually use it for other purposes. I uh, occasionally sell and service commercial radio, uh, and we put up these towers and things like this. So I use it to transport sure. supplies and so forth. You know, I have bigger ones than we do that with. For uh, so this is a toy. Okay. So this is a, a unit you could go out in the field in the emergency and do your own field emergency communications. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you have the, your gear in, the, in your vehicle that you could hook into the tower. Well, actually that, or we could put the gear right into the compartments. Okay. In the trailer? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. there's a tent on here too. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah. you can operate from that. In the uh, uh, winter time, uh, we have uh, propane heaters, so you could heat a tent like that if you needed to. So we could actually go out and actually do this thing in, uh, in an actual emergency type event. But, uh, Basically, it's a field day. We have some other or, uh, some other um, uh, things. For example, the Groton Road Race that tower is used yep. at. Yep. Okay. And um, uh, next weekend will be the Lonjo Bike Race. Uh, I won't be using this because we don't need it over there. Um, but the Boston Marathon and things like yep. that. So if we get a Pepperell Road, road Race going, maybe they could help with that. I I don't know what the Scouts Heaven are thinking forbid. about we having don't, a... We don't need more road races. Yeah. We don't have many extra weekends as it is now. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. So. Okay. But, uh, okay, Dave. Thank you. But they're all networked. So, um, if that one has one radio, this one has one radio. And everything you enter here will show up as being entered over there. Is that, is that the question you're asking? Well, no. This radio is at the Queen Charlie over. one QC from Nancy 1, Nancy Charlie 2. And one NC, uh, this is one QC. Oh, okay, so we were at the show. We're going to run USL 3 Alpha New Hampshire. Yeah, we're 3 Alpha Eastern, Eastern Mass. Right? USL Eastern Mass, thank you. QRS that? No, maybe what you did when you got back to work. Right now we're in one radio. I have the volume that's supposed to work on. Which one? N1 QC. Over. N1 QC. 3 Alpha. Thank you, Field Day. Thank you, Field Day. N1 QC. Over. Thank you, Field Day. N1 QC. Over. The hydrates essentially... So, this is the Morse code station. And I'm just uh, tuning around the frequency band looking for stations calling CQ. And then we log their call sign, the class they're in, and the section they're in in the country, the ARRL section. And uh, the uh, logging software will tell you if uh, uh, if you've uh, talked to the station before, and if you haven't, you go ahead and log them, and then you move on to the next contact. And you try to get as many contacts as you possibly can because it builds the score as fast as you can. So you're generating CW signals with a computer? Yes, and I also have the manual key as a standby if I want to. But really the exchanges are very mechanical and what you do is very mechanical and as you get into higher speed it becomes more difficult to send manually. Some guys can do it, I can't. W3CMA. Now I call him with my call sign. He comes back to me. He's 2A in EPA. And I come back to him and I say, You're 3A in Eastern Massachusetts. He says, Thank you, and then he goes on to the next one. FD is the Nashua Radio Club, and I know that by their call sign, but I've already spoken to them.
you have S9. Okay, you copy your call sign now as uh, Kilo Charlie 8, Uniform Alpha Victor, 3 Alpha Michigan. Okay, thank you for bearing with me. Anyone didn't see it? Clear. I'm Jill Gallus. Yeah. I'm yeah. from New Hampshire. And um, with me is Elizabeth Harmon. And I'm also from New Hampshire. We got our license last year. We, we tested in August, got oh. our licenses. And um, we've been on a couple of times, but this is our first contest that we've done together. Uh, Elizabeth is in my Girl Scout troop, and she was able to come down today. Um, we had, what do we have? Started with six girls and ended up with three, four girls who went to um, test with us last August, and uh, it was it's been it's been fun working as a as a team together, working as a group together. So Elizabeth has her own radio, and uh, I have a radio, and my father's at part of this club, so he invited us down today to work. Elizabeth has made amazing contacts. I've done eight contacts today in an hour and a half. And in the first half hour that Elizabeth was on, she made, have you counted them yet? Fifteen contacts? Um. You have uh, general class licenses? Or? No, we have technicians at the lowest level. Okay. So she made 17 contacts wow. all the way to Puerto Rico, lots of states. She only Duplicated two states, I think. Good, so wow. she's had some good contacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you you involved with any of the uh, other activities of the? For ham radio. I was thinking more of the going out and doing other uh, uh, road races and things to help them out with their communications for public service. We haven't done any assistance with ham radio. We did yeah. work one of the stations for Reach the Beach. Okay. a couple years back yeah. um, but that was just helping out at a Girl Scout hut uh, and yeah. um, preparing meals for the runners um, this is this is our first time we've even dabbled in ham radio but with all the disasters that we've heard about all the spring rains and flooding we've said you know this is this is pretty good maybe we can help out our town and yeah. do some service there so it was the public service that dropped drew you into the, the activity the potential yeah and not also, necessarily being able to talk to people far away yeah. Is it rolling? Yes. Yeah, so you're the president of the club here. I'm not president. I'm just the, today's field day chairman. Okay. Excellent. This year's field day chairman. So what, what's your uh, cut at the girls joining us, joining you today? Oh, this is fantastic. I mean, we've been hearing about Skip's uh, daughter and uh, friend Elizabeth for a little bit, and we were glad they came out to join us. and. Uh, learn a little bit about the ham radio activity and yeah. get on the air. It's wonderful. Yeah, nothing like hands-on. Excellent. Definitely. 
it's definitely gotten easier and easier the more we've been on. Yeah. Ah. It well, more does. and more frustrating as we can't get any contacts. But <laughs> oh yeah, well you know. I think it's lunchtime. So. Yeah, we've been working a lot of contacts. There's uh, a lot of duplication happening now. Now, yeah. Yeah, because uh, everybody's worked the bands overnight and uh, um, done a lot of contacting them but uh, how are, how are you guys finding it I mean I was just coming over to find out how you very easy. enjoyed it very easy a lot of fun and we we always cheer and check to see if we've worked the state before and excellent. how many times have other people in the club contacted you know the same person on another band excellent excellent that's great so have you how much activity have you done at home in the, in the last year and a half that you've or two years that you've been doing it I was on for another contest yeah. in December, mm -hmm. September, early half of the school year, yeah. and um, I've been on three times, three other times as yeah. myself, as my with my new call. But I've always hung out with my dad in his ham shack. Ah, so okay. I've been on. I've been listening a lot. I haven't been operating. So have you been on the air at home yet? Um, only once. Yeah. Really good at talking on the radio. Well, it gets easier the more you do it. Yeah, yeah this would be a great experience here. Yeah, I think. and Elizabeth's been up on my hill, ah. so uh, yeah. she's talked at, at my house too. We had a pretty long conversation with one guy who was driving along one of the highways headed up into New Hampshire, and we just okay. talked to him the whole way there. And another guy cut in, and we had a, we ended up having four of us talking at the same time. Wow, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, excellent. Very good. Well, thank you very much today. You're welcome. Thank you.